Michael Ramsden tells a silly story about three turtles. Three turtles are going out to a picnic. Turtle one is carrying the sandwiches. Turtle two is carrying the drinks. Turtle three is just along for a picnic. And they get about halfway to their destination and a storm erupts, rain falls. They take shelter under a large rock. And as the rain falls, turtle one and turtle two say to turtle three, listen, we brought the sandwiches. We brought the drinks. You didn't bring anything. And so we were just talking and we think you should be the one that goes back home and gets the umbrellas and brings them back so that we can go on to our destination and have our picnic. And Turtle 3 says, there's no way I'm doing that. I know what's going to happen. The minute I'm gone, you're going to eat all the sandwiches. You're going to drink all the drinks. And there won't be anything left for me. Turtle 1 and Turtle 2 say, no way, that'll never happen. Turtle 3 refuses to go. Turtle 1 and Turtle 2 swear on their shelves that they won't touch the sandwiches. They won't drink the drinks until Turtle 3 comes back with the umbrellas. So Turtle 3 disappears. Minutes turn into hours. Hours turn into days. Ten days later, Turtle 1 and Turtle 2, dehydrated, starving, croak out to one another. Let's just eat the sandwiches. Let's just drink the drinks. And all of a sudden, Turtle 3 pops up from behind a rock and says, If you do that, I'm not going home to get the umbrellas. <laughs> well, it's a silly story. But it gives us two themes necessary to start the sermon. Picnic. <laughs> Today is our first summer picnic. And picnics are part of the life of this church in the summer. They're great opportunities for us to get to know each other and spend some time together. And if you're Turtle 3 this morning, it's okay. There's no rain, no umbrellas needed. There'll be plenty to eat. Injustice. Turtle 3 was certain that this picnic was about to be a place of injustice, a place where some people got everything and some people got nothing. I hope that our picnic is not a place of injustice today. You might want to get at the front of the line. But injustice is a key theme in these enthronement psalms that we're studying on Sunday mornings. As we saw last Sunday in Psalm 96, God's reign is inclusive. It touches every person on the planet. And so the psalmist was telling us last Sunday, God is able to work for justice on behalf of every person on the planet. And Psalm 97 takes up that theme of justice and injustice and explores what it means specifically for us to become involved in that work of fighting injustice. So Psalm 97 begins as many of the enthronement psalms begin. Let's say this out loud with gusto. The Lord reigns. The enthronement psalms want us to believe that there is someone up there in charge. There is some plan that's being worked out in some way. God reigns. And then these psalms are inviting us to live as if we actually believed that was true. Now, the way that Psalm 97 describes the reign of God is a little scary. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains Melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. Now that sounds like end of the world kind of stuff, doesn't it? It sounds apocalyptic. I mean, if, if that's what the reign of God is like, I'm not sure that I want in. It, it just feels a little scary. It might help to know that the psalmist is borrowing this language 
from somewhere else in the Bible. Authors would often do that. And this psalmist is borrowing language from the story that we call the Exodus story, the, the, the long story of the people of God leaving slavery in Egypt and making their way to the promised land. And this language comes from one of the most important descriptions of Mount Sinai. So Exodus chapter 19, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning as well as a thick cloud on the mountain and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now all of Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln while the whole mountain shook violently. The psalmist is borrowing language from this scene because for the writer of Psalm 97, the Exodus story teaches us something important about the reign of God. The psalmist is using language from the Exodus for the reign of God and setting us up then for this description of the reign in his psalm. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So if, if somehow we could see God's throne, the psalmist is saying, it's constructed out of two things, righteousness and justice. In other words, if we could summarize what it means for God to be in control, one way to do that would be with these two words, righteousness and justice. And in some ways, these two words are synonyms. These two words mean the same thing. In fact, the word that's translated righteousness here is sometimes translated justice elsewhere in the Bible. If there's any difference between these two words, it's this. Righteousness might refer to a value, God's value for doing what's right, for correcting injustice, for bringing equity and fairness in the lives of people. And the word justice refers to the action that God takes to make that happen, the steps God enacts to bring justice on the earth. And the psalmist is telling us, when you think about what it means for God to be in control, think about these two words. And then, in order to help us see, he takes us back to the book of Exodus. So in summary, God's reign, he's saying, at its, at its foundation, at its core, is a reign of valuing what is right and good and fair, and then acting on behalf of people to ensure what is right and good and fair. And the author likes the story of Exodus because there's something about the story of Exodus that helps us to see God's righteousness and justice at work. Because the story of Exodus begins with grave injustice, the people of God enslaved. So back in Exodus chapter 1. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come. Come. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. The story of Exodus begins with the opposite of righteousness and justice. It begins with injustice. And fortunately, God acts now with righteousness and justice. So Exodus 3, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. 
And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Psalm 97 is pointing us back to the Exodus story because it's such a perfect demonstration of what God does when he sees people suffering. He enacts justice and righteousness. The author is using this imagery to remind us that living in the reign of God is living in the rule of a God who is holy and completely determined to set things right. So he's replaying this same theme that we saw last Sunday in Psalm 96. But now he takes it a step further. Verse 10, O you who love the Lord, hate evil. This is Psalm 97's ultimate point of application. This is the author saying, so what? What do we do with that? Here's what we do with it. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. Righteousness and justice are God's way of hating evil of being moved by the suffering that he sees upon the earth. Hating evil is now what we are called to do. This is the author inviting us into God's work of righteousness and justice. And so Psalm 97 is telling us that living as if God reigns means not only trusting that God acts against evil, as we saw last Sunday, but now this Sunday, it means that we too hate evil and act to address it in our world. Now, this verse has been particularly thorny for American Christians. For too many American Christians, Psalm 97's call to hate evil has often been perverted and, and misinterpreted and maladjusted to mean Things like banning books, especially books against racism, or, or denying gender-affirming care to transgender individuals, or, or blocking attempts to support the LGBTQ community, or preaching hate just in general against immigrants or non-Christians or people of other religions. For example, Hannah Livingstone for the BBC produced a 45-minute documentary simply called America's Hate Preachers. She spent about six months here in America with various preachers who were widely known as sort of hate preachers. Stephen Anderson, pictured here, was one of them, a preacher for a fundamentalist independent Baptist church in Tempe, Arizona. That church is so infamous for its hate that it's become known as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Anderson himself has been barred from travel to the UK, to South Africa, and Botswana because of the kinds of messages that he proclaims. He believes that the Holocaust was a hoax, that 9-11 was perpetrated by the government. He's a preacher of hate. Another person that the documentary focused on was Reuben Israel. He's a street preacher with a fairly large following. And he and his following go to major events all over the country to identify specific individuals or specific groups of people and to use megaphones and signs to indicate that that's the person or those are the people that are going to hell. And unfortunately, often verses like Psalm 97 verse 10 are interpreted in the same way. To hate evil becomes a license, a permission slip, to hate people in the name of God. I think Henry Ward Beecher helps reframe this for us. He says, you must learn to be good haters, but not of men. That is not the text. You do not need anything to instruct you on that point. You are too good in that already. You are to abhor evil. Ah, there are hundreds of men that know how to hate men where there is one that knows how to love a man and hate evil. 
Because evil is offensive to God because it is repugnant to the innate delicacy of every moral sentiment, because it wastes you, because it wastes your neighbor, because it is hurtful to society, because every benevolent instinct requires that you should hate that which is the common foe of all mankind. Therefore, you should hate evil. Jesus picks this up in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He critiques people who are proud of the fact that they love their neighbor and they hate their enemy, which seems to be a certain misunderstanding of texts like the one in Psalm 97. They've gone from hating evil to hating whoever they like to identify as their enemy. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And so the psalmist is really telling us here, you who love the Lord hate evil, that to live in the reign of God is to love what is good and godly and to hate what is evil. And the prophet Amos helps us with this. The prophet Amos says, hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gate. To hate evil is simply to establish justice. It's to adopt God's value of righteousness. It's to enact God's steps of justice. It's to take up our own role in the fight against injustice. With this call, Psalm 97 is inviting us to join God's work in defeating injustice in every corner where it's found. Now, what does that look like? Just three quick suggestions. First, we live as if God reigns when we hate evil by speaking out against evil. Remaining silent in the face of injustice in our world means that we're participating in that injustice. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Martin Luther King, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. Perhaps one of the first things that we do in hating evil is learning to speak out against injustice in our world. And I think one of the things that means for us as a church is this. It's really not enough for us to be a gender-inclusive church, a church where women participate fully in every level of life and leadership. We must also be willing to speak out against injustice that harms women in our communities, our societies, our nations. It's not enough for us to be open and affirming. We must also be willing to speak out against injustices that harm those in the LGBTQ community. It's not enough for us to be multi-ethnic. We have to be willing to speak up against Injustices against various ethnic groups. Second, we live as if God reigns when we hate evil by taking action against evil, personal and systemic evil. Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. At the end of your life, do you feel like there would be some people who would reflect on your life and say, yeah, she really loved the Lord. Yes, he really loved the Lord. I think that would be true for most of us this morning. But at the end of your life, would there be people who would also say, yes, she hated evil. Yes, he hated evil. And they could tell stories of the ways in which you spoke up against injustices and, and you engaged in fights against injustices in communities and cities and nations. That's a very different question 
And a much more challenging question, especially for those of us who have grown up in some part of the neighborhood of evangelical Christianity. Because many of us have been taught that those kind of things are sort of off limit. I mean, isn't that politics? And yet Psalm 97 is calling us, I think, to engage in those sorts of things. And third, we live as if God reigns when we hate evil by becoming willing to embrace the one who commits evil. I owe this third point to Dale Pauls, who reminded me of a line in a book that I've read before, but I had forgotten this line. It, it's a little heady. So here at the end of the sermon, put on your thinking cap. So this line comes from Miroslav Volf over at Yale in New Haven. The book is Exclusion and Embrace. It's a book about how should Christians respond to evil and injustice in the world. Volf writes from firsthand experience because he personally endured the atrocities of the Serbian-Croatian War and had to wrestle with how he would respond as a Christian to those atrocities. So I'll, I'll read a quote and then I'll unpack it. Wolf, the will to give ourselves to others and welcome them, to readjust our identities, to make space for them, is prior to any judgment about others except that of identifying them in their humanity. The will to embrace precedes any truth about others and any construction of their justice. This will is absolutely indiscriminate and strictly immutable. It transcends the moral mapping of the social world into good and evil. Within social contexts, truth and justice are unavailable outside of the will to embrace the other. I immediately continue to argue, however, that the embrace itself, full reconciliation, cannot take place until the truth has been said and justice done. Okay, so imagine a person or a group of people out there who've, who've committed evil and injustice in the world. And so the question now is, what is our response as people that are trying to follow Jesus? Bull says, think of two very separate things. First, think of an embrace. The, the metaphor for grace, mercy, forgiveness involves mind the ability to embrace even a person or people who've committed injustice is, is the ultimate solution and the ultimate response of those who follow Jesus. But practically speaking, he says that, that really can't happen. That can't happen until truth has been said about that injustice, and until justice has been served in some way, until that wrong has been made right. So it's sort of long-term. The other thing to think about, he says, is the, the will to embrace. The will to embrace. And what he's saying here is that the will to embrace the person or people who've committed evil and injustice can exist long before any truth has been told about their injustice, long before any justice is ever served. That will can exist even if justice never gets served in our lifetime. And I think what he's saying here is it's, it's that will. It's that will to embrace that keeps us from misinterpreting texts like Psalm 97. It's the will to embrace. Even if you never get to embrace, it's the will to embrace that keeps you from committing evil and injustice against people who commit evil and injustice. It's that will that allows us to see them finally as human beings also made in the image of God. And that becomes a vital way, involves thinking of hating evil. Bottom line, I want to encourage you this morning and this week to really meditate on that question. What might it look like for you to hate evil, to love God, and to hate evil? Thank you. i uh -huh.
clouds in thick darkness around him righteousness and justice are his foundation fire it goes out before him consuming all his foes on every side his lightning lights up the world the earth sees and trembles the mountains melt like wax before him the lord of all the earth proclaimed in heaven the people will see his glory all who worship idols put to shame worship him all you got Zion hears and is glad of your judgment for you for you protects the lives of his godly people delivers them from hands of wicked joy will shine on those with hearts upright be glad in the lord you righteous and give thanks to his holy for you